the NFL is at such a weird time right now. Just when you feel like you're keeping pace on what's happening, what's unfolding, well, the deck of cards ends up going everywhere because everything gets shaken up. It seems to always happen that way. But like I said, just when you always think that you're catching on, something changes. We saw the last undefeated team go down this week. We've seen quarterback changes, and we've seen teams come back from behind. We're going to talk all about that, plus give you a preview of next week's to come. I'm your host, Matthew Reardon, and this is Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. What's going on, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights, where I am your host, Matthew Raritan, and with me today, as always, is none other than Ed Smith. Welcome, y'all. And we've also got Thaddeus Lloyd. hey -o. Well, another week is in the books, guys, and the Chiefs are finally not undefeated anymore. Woohoo! The NFL world rejoices, but maybe they shouldn't. Um, we're going to talk about that later on, but there were some great games that took place this last week. We're going to talk about a couple of them and as well preview, uh, a couple more for this next week to come, but let's talk about first divisional game here. And that was the green Bay Packers and the Chicago bears. This ended up being a very interesting game. Uh, the bears, they had a lot of, uh, kind of drama going into the week, uh, team meetings, uh, they fired their offensive coordinator. What was going to happen here? Um, and the Bears came out, I feel like, pretty decent. I know uh, Green Bay start uh, started out with a touchdown. Uh, Jaden Reed. So things were looking good there for Green Bay. But the Bears, you know, they, they came right back with a field goal, then a touchdown. They took the lead, and you started to see things change a little bit with this Bears team. And I do think the Bears have potential. I don't think that they're this playoff team, but they are going to be better than the Bears that we've seen in years past, uh, whether that be Kayla Williams, uh, young wide receiver core in Romo Dunze, DeAndre Swift. They do have pieces there, but we were able to see them use some of them uh, this game, actually, as DeAndre Swift got involved. He got a touchdown. But in the end, Green Bay ended up being – just too much for them to handle. And Green Bay's special teams coordinator, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, but I'm pretty sure it's a spe special teams coordinator. He predicted that there was going to be a block kick at some point in this game just because of how low Cairo Santos kicks the ball. And what do you know? At the perfect time, that kick was blocked, and that was to win the game right at the buzzer. And it really doesn't get any greater than that, right, Ed? Oh, it most certainly does not. <clears throat> and you're exactly right. There were times and flashes in this game where you saw what Chicago could be, but what they are not. And it all just seems to go back to the leadership of the organization as a whole. As much as we talk about it, it is week in, week out, those organizations that do not have a solid front office with a solid game plan from the ownership to the GM to the scouts to the coaches down to the players. There's no cohesion there. They're just like, hey, let's get some great players and you know we'll win ball games. Well, you have to have a plan. And the plan is being put in the hands of Eberflus, who was there when the plan fell apart last time. So what what makes them think just by getting a, quote, generational talent going to change? Nothing changes. It's still the same thing. So much so that this is the 11th time in a row that Green Bay has beaten Chicago. 
Matt LaFleur has not lost to Chicago since he's been in Green Bay. This is his sixth season. In fact, the co- the head coach the last time that the Packers lost to Chicago was Joe Philbin as a replacement for Mike McCarthy when McCarthy was fired mid-season. That's how long it's been, and it's still the same old Bears. Mitch Trubisky was the was the starting quarterback of that Bears team. That's how long it's been. And what we saw out of Green Bay is some highs and lows. They are not consistent right now. They are good, and they can make some spectacular plays, like Christian Watson on that uh, throw that he just straight up dove for. That was really good. But Jordan Love just given away an interception in the red zone, that was bad. And we continuously see this with this Packers team. It has been frustrating as a Packers fan to watch this team because we never know if it's going to go the way that we want it to or if we're just going to be throwing our hands up in the air going, what happened? What was that? So there was that part of it. It was. It's always great to beat the Bears because – uh, we're their daddy. That's <laughs> simple, that's simple math right there. But uh, in a game like this, this helps us keep pace to try and stay within the race of getting that extra wild card spot because we all know where Detroit's headed, and mm-hmm. there's no stopping that. Yeah, uh, that that's yeah. We're, we'll talk more about Detroit, but they. They, they tend to own this division so far this year. But Thaddeus, you were able to see uh, you know, glimmers of hope when with that two-minute drill at the end of the game, Caleb Williams, uh, that what he led. That gives Chicago hope, you would agree, right? But just as Ed also alluded to, as long as Ibraflus is there, they're, they're just going to struggle. Yeah, and it, it's, it's a conundrum, though, because – on the one hand, we know Eberflus, he was the defensive coordinator for the Colts before he became, became the Bears' head coach. And since Eberflus has been there, this Bears' defense has been great. And Chicago, you know, despite <laughs> despite probably the worst quarterback luck when it comes to a franchise having a quarterback, one of the oldest running um, NFL franchises, they have not had a quarterback throw for 4,000 yards in a season. And despite that, they've actually had some good defenses, like when they went to the Super Bowl uh, almost 20 years ago. And they've kind of had it. And even Flus has provided some good, you know, defensive stuff. They have good defensive players. But the problem is, is he's one of those coaches that feels like they just can't get the offensive side of the ball going. They don't know what they're doing. Um, they hired they hired Shane Waldron. Uh, that didn't really work out <laughs> at all. This Bears offense looks marginally I'd say better um, without him in it but man it's just I, I don't know because if you fire Eberflus what's going to happen with the defense because when you would assume Eberflus is a bad head coach you might be right but look what happened with Robert Sala and the Jets as soon as Robert Sala left the defense just has fallen apart since then so it's it's, it's kind of a catch-22 what do you do obviously you'd want to get like a new offensive head offensive minded head coach to take advantage of Caleb Williams potential offensive capabilities with all these receivers, with this running game, with these, with this offensive line, but it's going to be telling to see how it's going to affect the defense next year. Yeah, that it, that is a great point because they want to kind of shy themselves off their defense, but Something's got to give with the offense and where they're at right now. It's just not heading in the right direction. But there is a common theme in the NFL with this happening, and I'm going to talk more about it here in a bit. But uh, the next game I want to talk about is another divisional matchup, and that is the Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, as you can see, I was happy to be right. I was happy to be wrong in this game. Uh, would you believe me if I said only one touchdown was scored in this game? You would, because that is a typical AFC North matchup right here. This was, to a T, what the AFC North is like. Uh, a lot of defense and some offense. 
Lamar Jackson in his career, same with Derrick Henry, they have struggled with the Steelers' defense. There is something to it that they just can never figure out. And once again, that happened again on Sunday. I'm not saying it was the most dominant performance by the Steelers' defense, but they held Lamar Jackson in check. They held Derrick Henry in check. And by doing so, you pretty much hold the Ravens in check because that is their two key focal points of their offense. And I was impressed with the Steelers' uh, defense in this game. Uh, Their offense, clearly I was not. But Baltimore, they do always bring a good defense when they play the Steelers. Yes, they have the worst passing defense in the NFL, but once you play the Steelers and you play another divisional matchup, it seems to kind of go out the window. And the Ravens looked like the typical Ravens against the Steelers. This was a nail-biting performance till the very end. You didn't know who was going to win, honestly, until the clock hit all zeros because that's how much this game could have swayed. Um, But, Ed, I want to ask you, are you, how impressed are you with this Steelers team? They seem to be squeaking out wins, uh, but at what point is that going to catch up? So this has been a Mike Tomlin team over the past five years, right? Mm-hmm. It has been just skim along just enough to get over the hump at the very end. You know, have the have that Chris Boswell field goal. Yeah, and I got it. I'll. Finish answering your question, but I want to ask you a question that uh, I'll have you answer in a second. Is Boswell becoming the best kicker in the North, in the AFC North right now? So that's that's the question. But to answer yours, I'm getting more and more impressed with the fact that um, Russell Wilson is a better fit than what we anticipated him being in this offense. It has just been has so much better with him under the controls versus Justin Fields. Justin Fields makes the easy look hard and the hard look easy. Yeah. Whereas Russell Wilson, he just makes the easy look easy and makes the harder look a little look a little shaky, but he still does not give it to the other team to put his uh, put that offense and that defense in a bad position. Now, what I saw uh, out of the Steelers' defense is they were blitzing on early downs all game long, which was making Lamar Jackson uncomfortable. Therefore, he started hearing footsteps when, by the end of the game, which – there were no footsteps there. So that is part of the game plan that Pittsburgh has for him is to make him uncomfortable. So he's not looking downfield. He's his eyes start dropping and looking to run before he actually has his wide receivers open. So that's been part of the, that's what I've seen out of Pittsburgh is they know the game plan against Lamar Jackson and they have executed it. And, They've done the thing that we talk about all the time. Don't take points off the board just to get a first down Mm -hmm. because you don't know if you're going to get those points back. It is, it is a plague across this league where coaches will take points off the board thinking that they'll go get the touchdown. Well, there's no guarantee of that. So take the points and make sure that you give your team the opportunity to have those additional points at the end of the game to win. And that's what Mike Tomlin does with Chris Boswell kicking six field goals in this game. And you see Justin Tucker, he misses two, which is very unlike his history. But since, but it looks like the tide's changing in that uh, department. Right, Matthew? It really is, and it, and I'll one up you is that it's not just changing the AFC North; it's changing in the AFC, maybe even the NFL. Because we always knew Justin Tucker was the best kicker in the NFL. He is statistically the the most accurate kicker of all time in the NFL, 
and he continues to do that until about now where things are starting to get a little bit shaky, which Thaddeus actually talked about last week. But it was almost unheard of for a kicker to kick a 50-yard field goal in Heinz Field, in Pittsburgh, Acrisure Stadium, whatever you want to call it, Three Rivers Stadium. Uh, it was almost unheard of. And Boswell does that on the regular, and so do some of the other kickers. But Boswell just is so consistent this year. And I don't have any of the numbers in front of me, but I had been seeing a lot of stats come out over the last week about Chris Boswell. And it actually blew my mind uh, on just the trajectory of where he's heading in his career. But it is very impressive. But I'd have to say it's been coming down to him and Brandon Aubrey uh, for the uh, the Cowboys as being two of the best kickers in the NFL. Um, Boswell, for sure, this year. He only has one miss on the year, and that was from – it was like a 63-yarder, I believe. So, um, But he still missed it, but it was still a heck of a, ch- heck of a shot. But Yeah, I would, uh, I would put um... – Boswell, last of the three killer bees from a decade ago. <laughs> um, Brandon Aubrey and Harrison Bucker. Bucker is yeah. hurt right now. He's out for four yeah. weeks, but he's been one of the most consistent kickers. Yeah, they all got bees in their name. I guess you just need to <laughs> have a bee in your name and you'll succeed as a kicker. But uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers do now control the AFC North with that win. That was very pivotal because that did change uh uh, swung a lot but one thing and the last point I'm going to talk about that no one's talking about and that's how you know this is a different Pittsburgh Steelers season than and then the years prior is they play tonight on uh, against the Browns and no one's talking about Mike Tomlin's 500 or greater seasons since he's been the head coach for the Steelers because all they need is one more win and they have nine wins, which would then get him his record and continue to go that. No one's talking about it because they don't need to because the Steelers are 8-2 and two this year. They aren't at the point to where they're mid, they're sub-500, or they're right there. They have a great record this year, and they have a great team, and I think that once Russell Wilson and the offense start clicking better, uh, things will look better for Steelers because their defense is always right there in the NFL. Uh, next game that I want to talk about here is going to be the game, the marquee, the premier, the number one viewed game all year in the NFL, and that is the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. We knew the Chiefs eventually would lose, right? Did we? I don't know. But so much pressure, so much weight is lifted off their shoulders now. And I think the NFL world needs to be worried because when you play, when you have that perfect record, you always have that pressure. You have that thing that's just sitting on your shoulders that you need to keep it. You want to, you want to tie the Dolphins record. You want to, you know, be known as one of the greatest teams of all time because you did that. But then once you lose, that weight is lifted off. And I've said it the whole time that the Chiefs were undefeated. This was never the best version of the Chiefs that we're going to see this year. The best version we're going to see of the Chiefs this year is yet to come. And for all we know, it's going to be in the playoffs because that's how, what they do every single year. Similar to how the New England Patriots teams did for so long too. Is Yeah, they were great in the regular season, but that defense in the postseason was unstoppable. And But regular season, they were always ranked like the 20th ranked defense, you know. But uh, the Chiefs, uh, the best version of them is yet to come. But the Bills, I was impressed with the Bills. Josh Allen, game-winning touchdown. It was electrifying there in Buffalo. Bills Mafia going crazy. This was a playoff atmosphere. And it always is when these two teams play each other, Thaddeus. But the Bills could have the regular season. The Chiefs will let them have that. But come postseason, we may see a rematch here. Who are you taking? I would take the Chiefs <laughs> because you know, as as I said, you know, I yeah, the reason I gave I picked the Bills to take over the Chiefs is because you know the Chiefs beat them in the regular season. You know, it's their Super Bowl essentially. That's what you said about playoff atmosphere. This was the Bills Super Bowl, and wow, they won it. Oh wait, oh no, they got you got second half of the regular season, and then you got the playoffs. So. It remains to be seen um, if the Bills can do it in the playoffs, which, 
you know, everyone knows is when it really matters. So I, <laughs> I would be taking the Chiefs. Again, the crazy t- 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 statistic I keep on pointing out to people, Patrick Mahomes in his career now is like six or seven years now. In the playoffs, has only lost to two quarterbacks, Tom Brady twice and Joe Burrow. Those are the only quarterbacks he's lost to in the playoffs. And until someone else proves they can beat him, you just you just got to take the Chiefs in the playoffs at least. Yeah, and Ed, the Bills had, I want to say, over 100 more total yards in this game, but it still came right down to the wire. I mean, that's just a typical Chiefs matchup. You can never count them out. And yes, when we saw that they had the ball with just two minutes left, even Tony Romo said, well, I've seen crazier things happen. Oh, yeah, by this Chiefs team. So it's like (laughs) you can never count them out. Yeah, and with going into this game, the Chiefs had the most 10-play drives in the NFL over the past six weeks. And that means that they're holding on to the ball, not letting the other team get up on them. Well, in this situation, they weren't able to hold the ball nearly as much as what Buffalo was able to. I uh, It was a almost a, what is that, nine-minute difference between uh, the Bills and Chiefs as far as time of possession. You're not going to be able to get a Chiefs team that does that is not very explosive down the field if you're not if they're not hanging on to the ball as much as the other team. Uh, and when it comes to uh, Superman, as you said, uh, Josh Allen, is this going to be the most replayed quarterback run for a touchdown since Michael Vick's uh, <laughs> <laughs> overtime uh, miracle run? all those years ago because this was this was pure will it wasn't any it wasn't his talent it wasn't his ability it was his will to get into the end zone on that final touchdown and nobody was going to stop that yeah and it's not i mean of course every team plays with intent to win But at the same time, the Bills didn't necessarily need to win this game because they aren't really tested in the AFC East right now. They they control the their fate with winning the the AFC East. I want to say they're they're only like a game away from clinching it. That's how close they are. Kansas City, on the other hand, yes, they they just lost their first game, but there's a lot more tested on their end in the in the AFC West right now. The Chargers. Chargers are looking great, and they're looking great very quietly. And then the Broncos. The Broncos are now having a really good season with a rookie quarterback. Granted, this will continue to be Patrick Mahomes' division until, well, maybe when he retires. But uh, there is going to be a lot more uh, you know, tests that they'll have to deal with versus Buffalo because they're damn near almost clinched. But – Yes, this also does have, a, I guess, a pivotal meaning because it could come down to who gets the number one seed, and the tiebreaker would go in favor of the Bills. So, uh, you know, they they actually did have more to play for in this game. But yes, it was a tremendous run. And if it, if you guys did not see the Dan Orlovsky thing on ESPN, you got to watch that. That that thing was so cool because it did show you from a pers- player perspective of Josh Allen on what he saw and the decision he made to run, and it was a great run, and it did win them the game. And that's those are the plays that win you games. So when your star quarterback, who is a big quarterback, does that, uh, you 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 like seeing it, but you hate seeing it because you would hate for him to get hurt. <laughs> so there were some great matchups uh, that took place this, this last weekend, and this was one of the top ones. Like I said, it was the most viewed game of the 2024 season, and rightfully so. Uh, Because it'll probably be a rematch in the postseason. But um, Thaddeus, recap on uh, how we did this last week. Yeah, so it was it wasn't a great week, but it wasn't a terrible week either. Um, There were a lot of weird matchups that we had this week. Um, But uh, Ed and I went three and two, and Matt went two and three, so very middling. Um, But then that puts Matt at twenty seven and twenty eight. 
Um, I'm at 32 and 23, and Ed is at 39 and 18. Well, it just shows you how close of a week it was because some of these games were toss-ups. They really were when we were talking about them, and it could go one of each way. And so that that just shows you with the records that we got. Granted, we're not always going to get perfect records, but – they, they were very close, so I could see why the week was like that. So um, this next week, though, some of them can be very clear-cut. <laughs> um, we'll start with this first game, and that is the Tampa Bay Bucks and the New York Giants. And before we talk about the game here, let's talk about what's going on in these organizations. On the plus side, Tampa Bay, they may be getting Mike Evans back, their star wide receiver. Baker Mayfield loves to hear that. All of Tampa loves to hear that. Mike Evans is their guy. On the other end, oh, man, New York Giants. uh, Danny Dimes has been benched and benched indefinitely. It sounds like he has played his last snap in New York. And, yeah, you may say, well, what if, you know, the starting quarterback gets hurt? Starting quarterback, might I add, is none other than Tommy Colcutts, Tommy DeVito. Uh Daniel Jones is not the backup to him. Drew Locke is. Daniel Jones has been demoted all the way to third string. He is done in New York. I I, I mean, the writing has been on the wall. It is officially on the wall now. Permanent marker. You're not getting it off. Uh, Daniel Jones is done in New York. And uh, I saw a player was not too happy about this. He thought it was messed up. Giants have nothing to really play for. Um, the rest of this year. I mean, you could keep it running, but another one of the big controversies is, well, number two on the depth chart was Drew Locke. He did not get the starting job. Instead, Tommy Colcutts leapfrogged him. I don't know if the mob, the mafia had something to do with this, uh, put a turkey leg to their head and said, you know what, we're going to, you're, you're starting him, but there's just a lot of drama going on right now. There's a lot of drama going on in New York. If you are an NFL team in New York City, even though actually none of them are there in New Jersey, uh, you don't know what's going on. It is a dumpster fire, okay? But I'll talk about that Jets team another time. But the Giants are just as bad, 2-8 and eight on the year, 0-5 at home. And they're going to be 0-6 at home after this game, okay? And that's even that's really embarrassing. That's really embarrassing. But Tampa Bay, I think, is going to be excited. Mike Evans coming back. Even without him, I think Tampa Bay is still a great team. Their record may not indicate it. They've dealt with you know several blows this year. But I've, I, I still have faith in Baker Mayfield. And I think that this team, they haven't reached their full potential because of the injuries that have surrounded them this year. But uh, I'm going to take the Bucks winning this one. And the Giants... I like the running back that they have, Tracy. I think Tracy is going to be a running back in the NFL for a while. Uh, The way that he runs, he is very physical, which could cut some years off his uh, career. But I really like his play style. Um, He's going to be the only offense this Giants team's going to have. So I'm going to go Tampa Bay winning this game probably 27-10. to Uh, Thaddeus, your thoughts? Um, yeah, so it's very interesting. Now they're just pulling the plug on Daniel Jones when people have been calling for his head, you know, the past 10 weeks, probably now, you know, they saw the first couple weeks and like, nope, uh, we want him back. But they, they started him. They kept on starting him for some reason. Um, and as far as this game goes, uh, yeah, I did hear Mike Evans will be coming back. Um, it should be a huge boost for, for the bucks. Um, and yeah, I, I would agree with you. I just, I think the Bucks they've had a couple really close losses to some good to great teams. You know, they lost in overtime to the Chiefs. They lost a close one to the Niners. Um, and they got, you know, they had close ones to the Falcons as well. And if, if it wasn't, if they were to win at least a couple of those games, they would have a winning record and they might be even top of the division because the Falcons aren't doing terribly well either. But it's just those one or two plays. Yeah, and they can still take this division, too, because the division's not doing too hot right now. Yeah, so 
it's still up in the air, and I think uh, they're going to have to capitalize eventually because this is still a good team. Um, Todd Bowles went out a great head coach. It's still a solid head coach. Um, and uh, do do we know if Malik Neighbors is playing in this game? Um, I mean, I know that he's been uh, dealing with uh, the concussions and all that. Uh, I think Malik Neighbors will be playing. Okay. Um, but it'll it, but you know Tommy DeVito in there. I think it'll be a close game. Um, especially in a, who knows with um, you know, like you said, Tracy's pretty good. Uh, Neighbors is really good as well. Yeah. But I'm gonna be taking the Bucks here as well. It's just I the Bucks. They've come so close, and they need to. They they they're seeing this opportunity to catch up and win the division for the third or fourth straight year. So yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be taking the bucks. Um, I'll take them, uh, twenty seven to seventeen. Yeah, I think uh, Kate Otten will be happy to hear Mike Evans coming back because Kate Otten's been pretty much their workhorse uh, receiving wise since uh, Godwin and Evans uh, went down. But Ed, your thoughts? Uh. <clears throat> Even with all the turmoil of injuries of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they're coming off of a bye, and they are the fifth highest scoring team in the NFL right now versus the absolute worst scoring team in the NFL right now. So it's a pretty easy call to say Tampa Bay wins this. The By how much? That's going to be the big question because I, if we really want to put pinpoint it, I, the Giants are the absolute, also the absolute worst team in protecting their quarterback. I, uh, they're getting the the quarterback position itself is being sacked eleven <laughs> percent uh, of the time. That is a, an astronomical number for any quarterback, any offense across the board. So this is going to be a boat race. We're going to see 38 to probably 9 uh, out of this game just because you've got one team that knows how to play offense and one that absolutely does not. And as far as Tommy DeVito starting over Drew Locke, I think it has more to do with fans in the stands because the fans want Tommy DeVito yeah. more so than they want Drew Locke. Drew Locke will, can win you games, but right now the Giants don't necessarily need to win games. They just need to get people in the stands enough to, have, to keep, the, keep the boat afloat, if you will. No, they need people in the stands to pay for Daniel Jones' contract that they're pretty much wasting. <laughs> they got to make up for it somehow, like the Deshaun Watson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so all three of us easily had the Bucks winning this game, and I, I just I, that's how I feel like things are going to go. This next game, we got the Tennessee Titans and the Houston Texans here, and the Titans have been such a disappointment to me somewhat the reason why i say somewhat is because you know they, they corrected some things by getting you know calvin ridley they got tyler boyd um they originally had deandre hawkins on the team so you thought their wide receiver position was set um and they got some key guys on defense too but they never fixed the quarterback position <laughs> they seemed like they had all their chips in on will levis mr mayo and they it hasn't really been paying off. They've only won two games this year. Where on the other hand, Houston being the AFC South winner last year, they surprised a lot of people. CJ Shroud, they're seven and four this year, and they should be eight and three. That they should have never choked against that against the Lions. That would have been such an impressive victory, but they they did lose. A loss is a loss. So they are seven and four, but Houston is looking like they could be one of the best teams in the NFL right now because Joe Mixon is looking incredible. And this is the typical, and I talk if we t I talk about it at work because I live in Cincinnati, is this is the typical Cincinnati Bengals effect because players end up leaving the Bengals and they thrive elsewhere. 
Joe Mixon is a prime example right now because he's living his best life right now. And if it wasn't for his ankle injury, Joe Mixon would be probably number one or number two running back in the NFL. Derrick Henry, obviously, with the year he's having, he's easily number one. But Joe Mixon has been doing great things since he came to Houston, and he's enjoying it down there. And the Texans with a healthy wide receiver uh, with – Nico Collins, Tank Dell, CJ Stroud's got plenty of weapons throughout uh, just his plethora that he has. And their defense, uh, with a defensive-minded head coach with D'Amico Ryans, Houston is going to be around for a while. That That's almost obvious now. But Ed, being a, a Texan, <laughs> how impressed are you with this Houston team and just what they're doing? And they're only getting better, it seems like, each week right now. They're getting better, but I think that loss to the Lions a couple of weeks ago, that really stings. Mm-hmm. That That's something that kind of sits with you. Uh, so, yes, they took it out on the Cowboys as well they should have mm-hmm. because everybody takes it all out on the Cowboys yes. as well they should. <laughs> um, this is a team that has all the pieces, but – don't you feel like something is missing? Mm-hmm. There's there's just that one intangible thing that I I don't know if I can quite put my finger on it, but it's keeping them from being a, a true Super Bowl contending team. This is definitely a playoff team. This is definitely a upper echelon of the AFC team, but I don't think this is a Super Bowl team. There's something missing there. So that's... I- that's where I am with the Texans. I don't know who their offensive coordinator is, but maybe – I and I don't want to – no disrespect towards him, but maybe that's what it is. Maybe they need a, a really offensive – mind, uh, well, no, well, an offensive coordinator that's going to really lead them to the promised oh. land. Um, I'm drawing a blank on who their offensive coordinator is right now too, but – He was interviewed several times in the offseason – um, okay. Ah, gosh, it's uh, it's Bobby Slowick. Yeah. Slowick. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. he's he came he came from the uh, the Shane Han tree. Okay. Well, then he should be they that they, they should be succeeding there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because I mean, they do have all like Ed, you said it perfectly. They have everything that they need, but something's still just not clicking. And once it does, they they, they will be a serious threat in the AFC. I, I, I truly do believe that. But uh, I'm going to have Houston win in this game here. Tennessee, they just can't really seem to get much going. Um, I, you know, I'm struggling on if they're going to score 10 or 14. I don't know. But Houston is going to give you a good, solid, probably 28 piece. So I'm going to go 28 14. I'll give the Titans an extra four points there. I'll get 28 14 Houston here. Thaddeus. Yeah, it's this Titans team. I think they have done some improvements um, from last year, but I'm actually I'm wondering what what's happening with Mike Vrabel uh, if he's going to be hired next year as a coach. Oh, he will. Uh, who knows? That'd be interesting. <laughs> um, but they have fixed some things, but um, yeah, they're still not a great team. Uh, you have your Will Levis moment. Uh, it's happened every, <laughs> every week. He's had the most mimatic moment you'll ever see with like a 60 yard touchdown. It's happened every week, but they still end up losing by like 20 to at least any like decent team. And the Texans are definitely a decent team. Um, and like you said, uh, Stroud is almost, you know, even though Diggs is out for the rest of the year, he's basically got his full assortment of weapons back um, and it's just the, and like Ed said, there is something off on this team. Like they were expected to, you know, take a step forward from last year and last year was very impressive. Um, but I just feel like it's been like kind of like a sophomore slump for CJ Stroud. Um, the offensive line hasn't been as great, but all that to say, I do think the Texans are also going to pull out this win. It's just the Titans are just one of the bottom five teams in the NFL right now. And the Texans are trying to keep, you know, that division title right now uh, because the Colts, well, they won last week as well. So uh, they're just trying to keep pace with that. 
Um, so yeah, so give me give me the Texans. I uh, will say thirty one to thirteen. Well, 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 well. I find myself in a bit of a conundrum. Uh, do I go ahead and just pick the Texans because y'all did, and that just keeps my lead in picks uh, no matter what? Or do I take a look and make this comparison with... Uh, with Harold Landry, with Arden Key, with Sebastian Joseph David, uh, and Tavondre Sweat. That defensive front seven for Tennessee, I think, is a bad matchup for the Texans. And that, I don't know if it's going to be enough for them to beat the Texans, but I think it's going to be more entertaining of a game than what you guys are calling for. Uh, these that front seven is going to get in C.J. Stroud's face. He's not going to be able to wait on these long, uh, long drawn out, uh, time consuming plays to develop. He's going to have to be able to get get rid of the ball quickly, and that front seven can stop the run fairly well. So, I will take the Texans. But I'm going to take it, uh, if I were betting on this, which last time we saw it is an eight-point spread, I would take the points uh, for Tennessee on that. Uh, I am going to take the Texans at uh, 22-20. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, you definitely got it closer there. So, uh, great point, though, with uh, that defensive line and maybe – trying to really disrupt things for CJ Shroud and getting that rhythm. It could very well happen. So uh, next game is a divisional matchup as well. And this is a very interesting game. This is actually one game that I'm really going to keep my eye on this weekend, and that is the Arizona Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks. The Seahawks last week beat the 49ers, um, which we weren't really fully expecting because we – we're kind of expecting the Niners to get back to that form that we're used to seeing them at. But one thing that I saw in that game, and it's pretty much all I needed to see, was the Geno Smith touchdown run to win the game. Geno Smith is one of those quarterbacks that when he has that confidence, he proves a lot of people wrong. He's proved me wrong time and time again because I've had my doubts on how he could really be because I saw him with the Jets. But maybe that was just because that franchise is so bad that it wasn't really him. Where now, since he came to Seattle, we've seen a new Geno Smith kind of reborn and really give this NFC West some tough competition. The Arizona Cardinals have secret really quietly been atop of the NFC West lately. They are pulling together some impressive wins. But I just think Seattle, with that win over the Niners last week, which was a big win because it's, it's always tough to beat that 49ers defense, and they did, and they won the game in on the road. They're coming home. The 12th man, no matter how good or bad the Seattle Seahawks team, the 12th man always shows up. It's a very tough a place to play in and that confidence that Geno Smith now has by beating the Niners on a walk-off touchdown I think is going to propel the Seahawks to then retake the lead in the NFC West the Seattle Seahawks led the NFC West early in the year as they started out 3-0 and but since then they have fallen down uh I think that they get this win, and because of that, both them and the Cardinals will be 6-5 and five atop of the West. I'm going to pick Seattle here. I'm going to pick them uh, for the home win. I'm going to go – it's going to be a close matchup here. We're going to go 17-14 to 14 Seattle. Uh, Ed. So there's, there's a significant number uh, when it comes to the Cardinals in this game. And that number is 304. The the number 304, every game that Arizona has won 
they have gained more 304 or more yards in every in every one that they've had. The most that they had gained and lost was 303 against the Packers. And considering the way that this offense is rolling right now, that bye week may have been a bad idea, but any NFL team wants to get the bye week to kind of rest up and get their players healthy. But coming off of a bye week uh, with a rolling offense that they have going to Seattle that just came off of a an emotional, I will I will say, emotional win over the 49ers because that's been the monkey on their back. That's that's the motion I was making earlier was get the monkey off of the back, very mm-hmm. Steve Young like. Um, so I'm going to take Arizona in this one, just because I believe that they understand what their offense is right now and are tapping into it in such a way that it is going to be tough for Seattle to I uh, get it under control especially since they are a defense that is giving up 350 yards a game. So you it just seems like a fit where Arizona is gaining a lot and doing well on offense where Seattle is not stopping enough to to keep that from happening. And Arizona is going to take this and I think this won't necessarily be a blowout, but I don't think it's going to be particularly close. Uh, I'm going to call this one uh, probably 23 to 23, 13. Thaddeus. Well, it comes down to me, I guess. And I've, I've had some thought about this one too, because it's interesting. So we had the Seahawks who beat the Niners uh, for the first time in six attempts. Um, And then you have the Cardinals who are coming off a bye and they're kind of known they're six and four. They're known for being a little inconsistent However, that defense looked really good. They haven't allowed touchdown in their last three games. Coming off a bye, um, I'm just I'm really not quite sure. You know, especially you know as a 49ers fan, you know both wish they could both lose, <laughs> but um, it's it's going to be very interesting. I'm I think I'm going to have to take the Seahawks on this one though. My gut's just telling me they're they're going to pull it off. I mean, it, it, it's really a toss up for me. Right now, if the Cardinals can win this, then I can call the Cardinals more consistent because they've had some really weird losses. They've had some great wins with some really weird losses as well. So for now, I'm labeling them inconsistent. But if they can win against the Seahawks, I will call them legit consistent. And they might even, their chances of winning the division will probably go up like 10, 15% if they win against the Seahawks. So. It'll be really good for them, but Seattle is also in the mix as well. So it's it's gonna it's it's gonna be a tough battle, I think. Um, but give me give me the Seahawks, um, twenty one to seventeen. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a pivotal uh, matchup because the Cardinals could then take a two game lead by winning this game, whereas if the Seahawks win, they then tie the C, uh, the uh, Cardinals so uh, that it is a very very big game in the NFC West but Ed you talked about the monkey off the back and th- you knew it was going to come up this game but the Niners and Packers here <laughs> the Niners being that monkey that is always on the Packers back the Niners seem to kind of own the Packers uh, when they play each other it has been a very tough hill for Matt LaFleur and the Packers to get over and they could be having the best season, which they're having a way better year than the Niners are having this year. Granted the Niners dealing with a lot of injuries. Uh, the whole IR is the Niners roster, <laughs> <laughs> but they are still 500 team and they still have one of the best defenses around 
I've picked against the Niners a lot this year because of the injuries and they just really haven't proven to me that they're this team that we're going to see like we did last year, go to the Super Bowl and give, you know, Patrick Mahomes a run for his money. And yes, it's not fair to really say a whole lot of that because of all the injuries they're dealing with, but it's still the truth. They aren't much of a threat right now in the NFL because of that. And a loss against the Seahawks last week really kicked them while they were down even worse. Green Bay, with their uh, nail-biting win right at the buzzer, they've got confidence. The Niners don't have confidence right now, especially after that loss. But the Niners still have the Packers number. (laughs) And that is why I'm going to have to go with the Niners here. Because just like Ed would consistently pick the Chiefs until they prove him wrong, you have to go with that. Well, the Niners, I have to go with them because, well, they did prove me wrong the times that I picked against them this year. And they continue to control the Packers. So I'm going to go with the Niners this game. Maybe Christian McCaffrey starts, uh, now that he's back, uh, puts up some big numbers. And their defense, I think, is going to give... Uh, Jordan Love, a run for his money, too. So I'm going to go with the Packers here. I think there's going to be some more points on this uh, game being put up than I think is being really talked about here. But I'm going to go with a 28-24 Niners victory here. Thaddeus, I put you on the spot with your team here. (sighs) All right, yeah. So, <laughs> so looking at the numbers, this this is a must win for the 49ers. Um, the Packers have looked good but inconsistent. They're they're like the Cardinals, but a little bit better, I think. <laughs> um, you know, but they've they've had this. So this game is going to be played at Green Bay, and the Packers have Jordan Love has had both of his losses at Lambeau Field. So that's something interesting to keep to keep an eye out for. Um, but the big thing for the Niners, this is a must win because if they win this game, their chances of making the playoffs are going to be at 48%. If they lose this game, chances will go down to 17%. And that's just not good. So you got that motivating them. And then um, a key piece was missing versus the Seahawks last week. Two of them, technically was George Kittle missed the game. He's missed two full games this year. They've lost both of them. He's going to be playing against the Packers. Um, And then the Seahawks were able to drive down that field because Nick Bosa was out for that entire drive. Uh, I think two out of the three touchdowns the Seahawks scored, Nick Bosa was out for both of those drives. So if if Nick Bosa can stay healthy, I know Brock Purdy is actually... uh, Injured a little bit as well, but I think he's expected to play. Um, With those factors going in, and I'm probably going to jinx it because I think I I picked the Niners in all the games that we've done, the Niners four, and I've only got one right, I think. (laughs) So I might be jinxing them, but I'm just giving my reasons why I think they're going to win. And and I do think there is going to be that little bit of revenge factor for the Packers, which is going to motivate them, and they have to keep up with the Lions in that insane division. Um, but I just think the Niners are going to come out with a win because they need to, um, they need to win at least two out of the three next games. And it's, it's going to be really hard, but this might be an easier win than versus the, the bills, which is in two weeks. So they're going to need to win now, keep up in the division. Um, because if the Niners win and if the Seahawks or Cardinals lose, Rams win. You're looking at you're looking at all four teams in the NFC West at six and five. Because <laughs> we're we're all, we're talking about the NFC North being the best division. Well, the yeah, NFC West, <laughs> the <laughs> NFC West is the most competitive division. So take like the SEC. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So in the end, I'm taking the Niners in this one. Uh, you know, you know me being a fan or whatever. But um, <laughs> let's get to say uh, twenty four to twenty one. <laughs> Ned. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let let me just get this straight 
What month is this game being played in? November. Oh, so it's not January. See, when the Packers, and the last five times that the Packers have played the Niners, every game that was not in January, the Packers won. So there is that part of it. Uh, it, Wasn't there a uh, Sunday night football one, though? The Aaron Rodgers game versus the Niners? They were, it was in January. That was, oh, that was, oh, end of the season. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yep. So, uh, so there's that, uh, regular, you know, regular season, not, you know, not being in January, definitely advantage Packers. Um, when it comes to, uh, a, a part of this game that is not going to be talked about as much, but, uh, that is with, uh, Wisnowski, uh, being out and you've got a backup punter in there. Is that correct? Yeah, we have Pat O'Donnell. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily think that's going to bode well for a field position. And the better field position in a game like this against a defense like that means a shorter field that you have to drive against that, which advantage Packers in that, in that scenario. The longer the drives, the more advantage the 49ers with their defense. I th- Plus... The Packers have been able to set up the offense to get the ball out of Jordan Love's hands fairly quickly, which means that Bosa's not going to make it home to get him on the ground. That is going to be a big factor of this game. I'm taking the Packers in this, partly because I'm a fan too. (laughs) Uh, But I do think that there are solid reasonings of the offense is geared to play against this defense. The fact that there's a good chance that the Packers will have better field position given the backup punter situation for the 49ers. And it's going to be at Lambeau Field, and it's starting to get a little chilly up there. So it's going to be a little bit of a weather game. I'm already hearing friends of mine that are in Wisconsin Talk about it snowing up there. Uh, Coming from sunny California, that's going to be a bit of a a difficult thing to handle this time of year. So I'm taking the Packers. I am taking them at uh, uh, 24-18. And let's go. Yeah, so uh, just two things I want to say. Yes, Ed, you are right. We have the backup punter. And our special teams has not been great this year. It's been one of the worst in the league, actually. Um, we've gone through, honestly, well, their backup kickers have been doing better than an actual kicker. Um, but yeah, it's going to be telling because, like what um, Matt was saying, you know, the Packers have Rich Basaccia as their special teams coordinator. The Raiders should have kept him as their head coach. Um, and it's just looking like the Packers are just having a way better unit since he got his since he's been there. Um, but it's going to be telling because you have that you have the Packers have a better special teams, way better special teams, I believe. But then what you were saying with Jordan Love and the passing attack, the Niners are actually, despite their defense being very average this year, and it's not up to the standard that we're used to seeing with the 49ers, they still have a top five pass defense. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Um, especially if Traverius Ward plays because Traverius Ward has missed the last couple of games because of his uh, daughter's passing. Um, I don't know if he's playing in this game, but if he does, him and Giamador Lenore, they're excellent duos, and it's going to be it's going to be real interesting to see what uh, what's going to happen with those matchups for this game. Yeah, it, it will be indeed, and another interesting thing that will be taking place this weekend is none other than the Hardball Bowl. That is Jim. The Hardball- the Har- yeah, <laughs> Jim and John Harbaugh will be facing off Ravens, Chargers. And this Chargers team has impressed me. Uh, thanks to Jim Harbaugh, I-, I will say that. The Chargers needed something to really help that organization, to really help that team because they did have – they they have talent. They have young talent, Justin Herbert, and – who was going to fix that? Well, none other than Jim Harbaugh, <laughs> national champion, uh, 
and he has brought his team to the Super Bowl when he was the coach for the Niners. This is who they needed, and I'm so glad they got him because he's really turned this team around. And the Steelers and Chargers faced off earlier in the year, and the Steelers won. But the Chargers, they have really improved since then. And a win here could really put a lot of pressure on the Chiefs. They could really be a team that's battling the Chiefs in this division. The Ravens, on the other hand, coming off that loss against the Steelers, they know they need a win also. We're at that time of the year where wins can be hard to come by, but you need every win that you can get. And the Ravens are going to need that. The Chargers are going to need that here because the wild card race is going to be a fun one. And these two teams right now are battling right now for the wild uh, for a wild card spot. So this is going to be a tough game to choose from because the Chargers, when it comes to big time games, especially like this, this is going to be a Monday night game. They tend to struggle when it comes to these games. Last week, though, against the Bengals, they rose to the occasion. I was impressed by that because they tend to not do that at all. So I was impressed that they were able to do that. Can they do it two weeks in a row? That's where the big question mark is for me because this Baltimore Ravens team, I saw it last week, they will attack Justin Herbert. They have a lot of playmakers that will create sacks and Justin Herbert has been banged up a lot this year, and that's the last thing they need is their quarterback in sacked again. But it's almost inevitable that it will happen. Um, and the Ravens are going to be pissed off because of that loss. I fully expect Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry to pick up uh, where they had left off the week before and run the ball. So I'm going to go with the Ravens winning this game against the Chargers. I would love to see the Chargers win this game, and I hope that they do, and they, they very well could, but I'm going to have to pick the Ravens in this matchup here. Uh, we're going to go 24-17 Baltimore. Um, Ed. So for, the, for those that watch sports movies like us, <laughs> uh, there's the movie Moneyball where they are evaluate it's a scene where they're evaluating players in a boardroom with the scouts and they're trying to pitch uh, Billy Bean, the general manager on a particular player about how good a hitter this one player is. And he just simply says, well, if he's a good hitter, why doesn't he hit good? Simple question, right? That's the way I feel about this Baltimore Ravens team. They are supposed to be, if they're dominant, why aren't they dominant? And they just seem to have something where they they are dominant, but they they are losing these games that they should be either more competitive in, I think, or, I don't know, it just seems weird in some off way. Kind of like the Texans in a way, but not as much as what the Texans uh that we talked about earlier are uh, for the chargers though. They are quietly a team that really does get after the quarterback. They have 15 players that have hits on the quarterback and the Ravens have 16. They are both teams that get home and get the quarterback on the ground whether it be in play, out of play, whatever. And I think that is going to be a, a a factor. Who can get there more? Who can get to that quarterback more? With the Baltimore Ravens' pass defense being as poor as it is, Ladd McConkey, who, in my opinion, could have some say in this rookie of the year uh, you know, ballot uh, when we get there, he has, I, I think there's an opportunity for him to really make a name for himself in this game against that defense. Yes, he he, I had a good game against the Bengals, but it was against the Bengals. Nobody really thinks of them as having a very solid pass defense um, or a solid defense in any way. So 
being that this is a game uh, that is being played in SoFi Stadium, it's across the country for the Ravens. That means long travel times. That means out of your routine. There's there's something about those types of games that scare me for the road team. Uh, so for that reason, I am taking the Chargers, and I think it is going to be another nail-biter because this is not the Phillip Rivers Chargers anymore. This is Jim Harbaugh's Chargers. They will slam the door shut when they get to the point where they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the J.K. Dobbins addition uh, was a great pickup, and he's going to be facing off against his old team. Uh, Khalil Mack, that pickup was uh, tremendous for the Chargers and, and has really paid dividends there. So uh, the Chargers are building for success, and they're doing it right in front of our eyes. And that Ladd McConkey draft pick was – was what they really needed. And yeah, he is a great rookie, a great route runner. And it, it, it's what he did in college. He's doing the NFL. And that's amazing to see, especially from a rookie. Uh, Thaddeus. So this is, this is another good matchup. Um, I, I'm going to, well, what Ed was saying earlier about you know, we had, uh, we were talking about the Steelers Ravens matchup and the Steelers were blitzing Lamar very heavily. And now Lamar has really only struggled against the Steelers. He's done pretty good against the AFC teams and absolutely demolished teams from the NFC. So I do think the Ravens are definitely going to have a bounce back. They're going to be, you know, like Matthew said, they're going to be angry at this. And I am going to pick them to win this one. Um... It, it depends, though, because what, what Ed was saying about the blitzing, if you blitz the heck out of Lamar, he doesn't do very well. He had the huge, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was that big game uh, three years ago versus the Dolphins, and the Dolphins, over half the snap, sent a zero blitz, and the Ravens scored only 10 points in that game. And it was like, what, what the heck, you just blitz Lamar? Well, people stopped doing that for various reasons. But the Steelers brought it back last week, and oh, wow, the offense isn't looking too great. They were able to stop Derrick Henry. So this is going to be a very intriguing matchup. If the Chargers blitz, because they do not blitz a lot, because they normally get home with just four, because they have a pretty good defensive line. Their defense is really good. They're the number one scoring defense right now. It's going to be a very tough matchup. But I just think Lamar is just going to be able to make those special plays that he makes every couple games. And this isn't the Steelers. So I do think they're going to be able to put up more points. They're pissed off. Um, this game is for the Chargers is going to have to go through Justin Herbert because the Ravens' pass defense is horrible, but the Ravens' rush defense is excellent. So, And that's what happened at the end of the game. The Chargers were able to win that game because of the run game. They were in there with the pass game, but when that run game just, boom, J.K. Dobbins touched down, they won the game. It's not going to be that simple against this Ravens defense. Say what you want. They might be bad, but they're not awful. And the one thing they can hang their hat on is that rush defense. So it's going to be up to Justin Herbert to see if he can win this game for them. Because the Ravens are going to be minimum putting up 20 points, I believe, in this game. So it's it's going to be up to him. I still don't know if Herbert is that guy. Everyone knows he's got all the tools for it. And he's had a couple good games, but has he really had that game leading, you know, touchdown drive kind of game, uh, your passing touchdown game. So give me the Ravens in this one. I'm going to take them by one score, though, 27 to 20. Yeah, I mean, a game like this for Herbert can do a lot for his career because he had he hasn't really had the, those games and he needs to win these type of games. And one last point I will add is the chargers defense has given up the least amount of points in the whole NFL. So they are like Ed said, you know, quietly, they are building something there and have great defense. So that is something to keep an eye out on because we know the Ravens do like to score. So um, that is about all we have today, folks. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Don't forget to miss us on our next episode, which will be our college football Saturday special. 
We'll have lots to cover there as the season is winding down. Um, if you could hit that likes and subscribe button and share these videos, we would appreciate that. And we look forward to talking with you more in the chat, in the comment section, where you give us your thoughts, your opinions on the games, the outcomes, how we're doing, whatever you want to talk about. We'll be there to talk with you. But until next time, guys, we are rounding third and we are headed for home.